let me first introduce myself. Uh, my name is Roman, and I work here in a company called Duist. Uh, I live, I'm originally from Russia, but I live here in Porto for almost three years. Uh, and I like Porto very much. And yeah, and I learned a little bit of Portuguese, but I'm not that familiar with Portuguese to, to make a public speech in that. So I'm very sorry in advance that I have to start speaking in English. I hope that's not a problem. I, I'm sure it's not a problem. Okay, so uh, I work in a company Duist as a web developer and I would like to share with you a little bit of my knowledge or of how do we attack the problem which we have. In a company we work on a task manager and we do have millions, like literally millions of users who use our product on a daily basis and the question of scalability and the question of uh, performance is very important to us. So I will share with you my point of view on this, on how to scale Python application, but uh, with no doubts, the very same approach can be used for any types of Python application, be it a scientific application like random scripts which you, uh, which you work on, or maybe, I don't know, uh, like data processing or whatever you use Python for. I will start from like my area from the like web development area. So it's to begin with one plot from quite old research. Uh, it's from 2011. There was a research and according to that research, there is a very strong correlation between the page load time and the rate of abandonness. Uh, sorry, abandon, come on. Uh, and the number of users who literally close uh, your page close their browser and never get back, uh, never get back to it. And as you can see, if your page loads uh, like six seconds or more, you lose more than a quarter of your users, of your potential customers, of buyers in your, uh, in your shop or whatever it is. So it's very important to keep that value, the page load as low as possible. Unfortunately, it's not that easy, right? And nowadays applications, web applications, do a lot of stuff. As a very simple example here, like there's a web request which tries to do something, for example, update an object. And uh, in the majority of applications, it's not just, you know, update a record in a database. You have to do a lot of uh, auxiliary stuff. For example, you have to update search indexes for the full text search. You have to send an email in some cases, like the object was updated or whatever it is. And you have to do a lot of stuff like update business analytics and so on. And everything contributes to the page load time. And it's getting even worse uh, if you do stuff like uh, make bulk updates, multiple updates at the time, or you run heavy analytics, or you access remote services from your requests, or you process images or uploads, or you export or import data. You know, there's a, like a button, export all my data. So we're not, in those cases, we're not talking about pleasing users anymore and squeezing those responses to two or three seconds. It's actually the question of survival. That's how it looks like, or may look like. What can we do? Uh, it sounds natural, right, to exclude unrelated actions from the request response cycle as much as possible. How it can look like? So now there is a second uh, page on how, in principle, it can look like. Look, we exclude from the request response cycle uh, include there only things which are crucial for our response, which is like updating the object itself. Uh, everything which is not related to, to the updating of the object, we somehow want to offload to other parts of the system. We want front-ends to add tasks to so-called workers, and we don't want to wait for workers to complete their tasks before returning the response back to, this, uh, back to the client. Also, workers can run their tasks maybe with a significant delay, and uh, those tasks, they can be finished 
or even started long after the response is sent back to the client. So we, and also we want the system to be distributed. So we want to run workers on different machines. That is, we want to run workers like on different processes, different machines, and so on. The question is, how we can achieve that, or can we achieve that at all? And can we achieve that without sacrificing uh, the readability of the code and the maintainability of the system? That's sort of the question which I would like to discuss today. Okay, so here comes the concept of message queues. And I claim that message queues is a silver bullet, one of a kind painkiller, and naturally the solution to all of your doubts and problems. And yeah, before going deeper to the topic, I would like to emphasize that like message queues, uh, this is concept is not new at all. And probably you're familiar with that. You probably use, I'm not sure. Do you guys use message queues? We have, Oh, okay, like, yeah. Uh, some people use it, some people don't. So if you guys use it, yeah, I, I'm not sure how much new do you know. Uh, but if you don't use, you definitely will get back from that, uh, that meetup enlightened. Uh, so it's not, message queues is nothing specific to Python. It can be quite easily implemented in any programming language and it was implemented in multiple programming languages multiple times. But uh, in our case, obviously in nature we will use, we will use Python. Okay, so message queues, how do they work? Everything in message queues revolve around naturally the concept of queue, which is, I mean, the, the concept of message queues is, you know, it's as simple, it's so simple that sometimes you can think that, you know, this is a scam, that I'm trying to deceive you, you know, it can be explained in five minutes and we are here, like, I will be talking for, uh, believe me, at least 40 minutes. So you may be thinking that I'm kind of trying to deceive you because it's very simple. Uh, everything is revol revolved around the concept of the queue, which is nothing but a tube. And you put messages to the tube from one side, like uh, web workers, uh, like web processors, or we, we can call them clients. They put messages to the queue from one side and workers which want to read and execute the actual things, they read messages from another side. And uh, that's basically it. Someone pushes messages to the queue, someone else gets messages to the queue and execute the actions which are written into it, in them. That's how it looks like. We have front ends, web front ends, or we can, you can call them clients of the queue, and we have workers which do their stuff. Then, that's how it more or less looks like. We do have jobs which have to be executed on front ends, and front ends simply put those messages to the queue, right? Like this. Yeah, magic happens. Cool. And then, yeah, like that. And also we do have workers who from another part, they get messages from the queue and they execute them. As soon as they execute one message, they get another one, oh, they execute it, then they get another one, and they're done. That's it. So that's how it works. Very, very easy. Uh, and here, I don't go much into details how it can be implemented in Python, so I mean, this is just the concept of the queue, of workers and front ends, everything is easy. How in principle it can be implemented in Python? On the concept, uh, conceptual level, uh, that's how the queue implementation can look like. Queue itself, please have a look on this list, uh, is represented by a Python list on the line two. Uh, the front end does the essential work within the request response cycle, which is like object update, and the rest of the things, uh, instead of executing them, it, uh, that, um, work, uh, that front end puts to the queue. In our case, I mean, uh, previously uh, I show you, oh no. I wanted to show you the concept of jobs, 
you know, those envelopes. And those envelopes in our Python code, they're represented as tuples, where the first item of the tuple is the callable object, and the rest of the tuple is our arguments to that object. So yeah, as you can see, we just put messages to the queue, like, like we put uh, tuples to, to list. And then there's a the worker part. Worker just in the infinite loop reads messages from that queue and executes them. As you can see, I mean, it just simply calls the function which, with arguments on lines 19 and 20. That's it. In this case, it's not quite clear yet how to run the worker and how to share the queue between frontends and workers. I mean, because it's just a simple list and it just s stores everything in memory. Let's address this issue with that thing. Okay, so now we, from the conceptual level, we go to the implement, actual implementation level. The solution number one for scaling your application is multiprocessing. It's good enough for some cases. It may be not very good enough for web workers, and also um, it scales only within the framework of one machine. It's, it's not distributed. Uh, frankly speaking, it can be distributed because it has some possibilities to run um, remote stuff on the remote machine, but we will not touch that part because it's not that easy. The good thing about multiprocessing is that that module is already, is already included, so you don't need extra libraries or infrastructure to make it work. Okay, so basically what uh, multiprocessing is, it's actually a Python magic built on top of operating system fork uh, call. And it allows you to run multiple processes, to manage pools of processes, to transfer data between processes, and it can even work, as I said, uh, with remote processes. We'll take advantage of all of that, except for, working, uh, for remote execution and that simple code. So let's uh, go to actual implementation, which does some more or less useful stuff. Uh, okay, to, to show you the difference and to demonstrate all the concept, I will create a very simple Flask application. Uh, and the first version of the Flask application will use a simple linear execution of methods. Uh, the second one will use multiprocessing queues. Uh, by the way, if by a chance you don't know how to use Flask, don't worry. I mean, it's, it's not the important part of this, of this talk. So this is, on this slide, the app itself. It's kind of fake app because, I mean, definitely we, we don't need like a real app here just for, uh, for the purpose of demonstration. This is the fake app. It emulates the real applications with delays and stuff. Uh, and then there is a Flask application which runs function from the main app one by one. That's a li linear application. That's what we are talking about. There's nothing special here. Uh, it just accepts user and object and stri as strings and, and does like linear stuff. No, no, nothing, nothing interesting. Uh, now let me show a slightly more advanced version of the same app, but with workers and multiprocessing. Look, here is the simple version of the application. No. Here is the simple version of the application. And here is a slightly more advanced version of the application. And I claim that that slightly more advanced version works much faster than the simple one. Uh, what are the differences uh, between those two versions? First, we do have a function which is called worker. And uh, first, on the line, Eight, we, we define the queue, which is kind of a Python list, but the advantage of that queue is that you can use it from multiple processes and it knows how to pass data around and so on. It's kind of uses a sort of the magic. And we do have a worker function. The worker function in the infinite loop uh, reads messages from the queue and executes them uh, exactly the same way we made it uh, on the conceptual level. And then, uh, in the front end itself, what we do is we simply, um, instead of executing 
uh, stuff uh, on a line by line basis, we put messages to the queue and return immediately. Uh, let's have a look how it works in action. Okay. So this is a simple linear case. That's exactly what we wanted to see, right? So we run the function. The function, like sequentially, uh, executes lines one by one. The server takes the request, executes functions, and returns a response. Like nothing special here. Let's now see another example how it's going to look like for the multiprocessing mode. There's a little bit more interesting here. Look, it works much faster. Uh, first, the thing which I would like to point your attention on is that the, the multiprocessing pool starts a bunch of processes. And it, those processes, they're just simply waiting for, for the messages in the queue. As soon as they receive them, they start executing them. And the web front end itself doesn't wait for anything. It just puts messages to the queue, forget about them, and so on. OK, this works. And it's just like one functions and two lines of code. Uh, there is, please note that there is nothing web specific or flash specific here. It works. Uh, but it's also kind of fragile, and it's not scalable enough, unfortunately. Fragile because if process dies, you lose all your tasks, right? Because they're stored in memory. Exceptions are not properly handled. And yeah, it's just one host because, I mean, it's just, you know, like it's forked and it executes within the, the, the framework of one host. Can we make it better? Can we scale it on multiple machines and can we ensure that our tasks are execute, executed on a safely manner? And also it would be nice to get back the results of our execution. Let's see what we can do. Okay, so here comes the time for the second solution. The first one was multiprocessing. The second one is Celery. Celery is a queue which provides everything you can imagine and even more out of the box. I mean, the web, this is the, the website of the, of the project. It's called Celery Project. And now the question is uh, what Celery is and most importantly, how we can get started with that. Python library. It provides a configurable, oh, configurable, configurable object which can help you to define your tasks. Kind of like this. Look, you create an object which is called an app in this case, and you decorate your functions with app tasks. Uh, so, yeah, that's it. By the way, Celery needs a storage, a backend to store the content of tasks. It hides low-level details from the application developer and lets developer to manage their task in a convenient and Pythonic way. So you can kind of think of Celery as of Django ORM or SQL Alchemy, but for queues. So it kind of provides a high-level abstraction on top of tasks and stuff. But it still needs a storage to store your data. In all our examples, uh, we'll use Redis, and we'll use Redis both as broker, which is kind of the medium to process queue data, and as a backend, a medium to save task results. It's not the best uh, storage for, for that things, but I mean, it's easiest to start off, it's easiest to run, and so on. By, by the way, if you never work with, uh, uh, with Celery, just don't work, uh, sorry, with Redis, don't worry, there's also nothing Redis specific here. You just have to know that Redis is the thing which can store your data. It's like a NoSQL database. OK, so first, Celery is, uh, provides a, a mechanism to define your task. Second, Celery provides your easy to consume API to work with your tasks, kind of on the front end level, right? Or on the client level. Actually, it doesn't provide 
any API endpoint and you do, don't have to call like uh, um, kind of salary methods or salary special functions to enqueue a task. Instead, it does something very, very smart and it turns your functions, which you decorated by the task decorator, as in this case, like app task, it turns them into, into fully fledged objects, uh, like subclasses of the task object. As you can see on the line two, uh, the get page size, it used to be a function, right? But now it's something different. It's call, it's, it calls itself a task. And this task kind of behaves like a function, but on top of that, it has tons of extra stuff to do. So for example, uh, it has, or like the most helpful function, uh, the most helpful method which it has is the delay method. Um, you call a delay method to the object and you're done. It doesn't block and it returns immediately a so-called async result. Uh, the async result, you can, I mean, what it does is uh, it puts a task to the queue to execute for workers <clears throat> and it returns you, to you an async result. You can ignore this async result if you don't care about the results of the execution or you can actually use it. Async result provides you another easy to consume API. Uh, with async result, you can see if task is ready or not. And also you can get the result of the task execution. So in our case, uh, whenever task is done, the worker stores the data into the database, in our case in Redis, and a sync result, because it has, every task has unique ID, it can retrieve back to res the results and uh, get them back to the caller. You may or may not want to use it, but I mean, it's here uh, and it's kind of very convenient thing. The third thing which Celery is, I told you, the first thing, it's, uh, it provides you the API to define your tasks. The second thing, it provides you the API to use those tasks. And the third thing is actually, it provides you a broker, a common line utility to run workers. Uh, and in this case, I run this in multiple processes. As you can see, I can tell Celery, please run me 10 workers, concurrency equals 10. And these workers will immediately start reading and executing tasks from the queue. And there's a sample output uh, close to the bottom line. And you can see that workers made some work and they like provide some results and so on. So yeah, with this functionality, you can already make something very, very helpful very, very easy. So far, I tried to build my presentation around kind of the concept of painkillers, kind of you have a headache, you have a problem, and here's the cure, like multiprocessing, celery, or whatever you want. But uh, we developers, we're infinitely curious species, right? So we kind of want to make our life harder and search every time for new ways to uh, make our life more difficult, which also means for us probably more excited. Um, and you can definitely make your life harder with Celery, and I'll show you how. Ah, uh, yeah, and below I will use some synthetic examples because I, I didn't manage to come up with some useful and at the same time small and useful examples. So those examples, they will be kind of synthetic. They don't solve any particular problem like, like this. Uh, and the first thing, it's not very exciting, but it required, it's required for further understanding. It's called task signature. Task signatures is yet another salary abstraction, and it's very easy to build. Uh, and it's very easy to explain. It actually represents, task signature represents a function with baked in arguments. Why we need that? And I mean, first, how it's created. You can see like, it's created with, a, with another method of the task, which is called S, S for signature. It's created this way, but why we need that? 
uh, unlike functions and unlike tasks, signature can pass through the queue. They're, they are subclasses of the dic dictionary, so they can be easily serialized and deserialized and so on. And you can pass them around as regular arguments. And besides, what you can do with those task uh, signature is you can chain them together. Uh, okay, so what does it mean? Uh, you can, once again, the code which we're working on to remind you, and the chain. As everything in Celery, it looks very Pythonic. Uh, you can build uh, a chain, okay, you can build a chain, and you can run this chain fully asynchronously with delay. Uh, let me go through that, um, that code line by line. So on the line first, we create uh, three, three task signatures, then we build a chain out of them, like as simple as SA, then SB, and then SC, and then we that's how, uh, on the line three, I will sh I also, I'm showing how it looks like. And then we call the chain the same way we call functions, uh, we call tasks with chain.delay. The result of the first task which was executed, in our case, the first uh, task or the first signature is A. The return value of that A, it will be passed as the first argument to the second uh, element of the chain, and so on. From the second element of the chain to the third one. So you can consider this as Unix, as Unix pipe. Uh, and then we like chain those tasks together. And what I want to point you out, even though uh, function B accepts two arguments to, to that signature, we provide only the extra value. It is because the first argument of that function will be to uh, the first argument of the function b will be provided as uh, from the function a kind of that's it and if you run this function if you get the result you will see uh, like that complex structure c b a like and so on that's written on the live on the line five so you can just fully asynchronously run run some code which will we call uh, which will call kind of itself the queue will, uh, will run itself this way. The next thing, okay, so that was about chains. Uh, the next thing is groups. Uh, you can group together tasks for parallel execution. Then you can subscribe to that group with get to get the result of the group execution, and it will be returned as soon as all tasks in the group are executed, kind of like this. Uh, an example is similar to the previous one, but instead of the chain, we define the group uh, with the with the group function. On the line three, on the line four, we can see how it looks like, and on the line five, we call it in a worker, in a asynchronous way. Uh, then on the line six, you can see what uh, the group returns. The group actually returns the list of all the results of the task in the queue. Can be useful. You can also ta call those tasks run by, uh, one by one, but with group, uh, there is a convenience method that you can just run get and not worry much about executing uh, about the results of uh, every single task. You, you will get back the results as soon as they will be executed. The next thing which it's kind of a mixture of groups and, uh, and queues, which we had a look on in the previous. Uh, it's called chords. It's kind of the next level of abstraction. It's a group chained with the task. And it looks like this. You can just create a group and you can pipe it to, to yet another task. And then it turns automatically into a chord. And when it turns into a chord, you also run chord delay and you get chord results. That's why you can see.
This is the thing which exists in salary. Sometimes it's very helpful. But I should admit, the majority of stuff you would probably do with asynchronous queues is just, you know, as simple as put tasks to the queue and forget about the results. Anyway, with that saying, Celery provides so many extra stuff. And I would like to just show you. I, can, I don't have time and I, uh, yeah, I don't have time to explain how they work and it's probably, it, it could be a little bit too boring, but just to outline. It has different backends. You can store data like in Redis, in MySQL, in Postgres. You can use RabbitMQ and so on. You can use different serializers. You can use like JSON, you can use Pickle, or like uh, you can use YAML to serialize your data. You can use callbacks and so-called airbags. So if your task uh, is raised, raises an exception, you can subscribe for that and the error back will be executed as well. You can return back from task some progress on its execution. It's also possible, like the task is done on 50%, 60%, 90%, 100%. It's, it's also possible. Uh, you can also delay your task. So you can, for example, say, I don't want to run this task immediately. I want to run this task 30 seconds from now, or 30 minutes from now, or one day from now, or like at 1st of January 2018, something like that. Naturally, you can ignore results of the task and it can be built in into salary because, I mean, you don't have to waste your resources storing the results which you ignore. You can add expiration date to your results to automatically like clean up the space for uh, clean up the stuff for your results. You can have custom retry policies. So for example, uh, it can be implemented on the client level or, or on the server side level, uh, on the worker level. On the client level, for example, if the worker is not, the backend is not available, it can retry and it can try again and again and again to put message to the queue. And on the worker level, you can also say that if the task raises an exception, try it one more time. For example, you can ask to try it at most five times Five, sorry, at most five times and with, with a exponential back off, something like that. Uh, you can put time limits on task execution. You can put soft, task, uh, soft time limits when an exception will be raised and you can put hard time limits where the, the process will be just killed. You can put rate limits on tasks. For example, for that particular queue, uh, you don't want to execute more than whatever amount of tasks per minute or per hour. Uh, you can use auto-scaling. In our example, we use like 10 processes, but you can tell Celery that the number of processes has to increase with, with, if the load, uh, with the load. And also decreases back if the load is going down. Uh, naturally, you can use multiple queues. It's very helpful. So for example, you can have a queue for urgent tasks, and you can have a queue for tasks with low priority, and you can use different mechanisms like different rate limits and different number of workers to serve those queues. You can use tools to inter for, for the introspection in statistics. You can have statistics about, uh, I don't know, how many tasks per day do you execute? You can see what's the status of workers, how many workers do you have, and so forth and so on. There is a web interface for that salary so that you can have a look how it looks like, and that's it. And also you, do, you can do periodic tasks and use salary kind of a replacement for your cron tabs. You can say like, I want to execute that task every five minutes, and you can run a special thing which is called salary bit, which will execute it every five minutes or you can execute the task every first Monday of the month. You can, uh, yeah, you can do this as well as, as you can do with cron. So you can replace uh, cron with salary. Please don't do that, but I mean, in principle you can. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff to do. Um, yeah, just once again, that's how the, the project website looks like. If you like Celery, go ahead, try to install, play with that. Uh, but please don't remember that uh, uh, Celery is kind of a, a big and heavy project and it requires 
a lot of, uh, not a lot, but at least one extra dependency, which is like the queue itself, which someone has to manage. And it's like yet another point of failure in your application. So just use it if you really need it. And don't use it if you can just scale uh, somewhere else. You probably maybe don't need to scale that much. OK. Uh, then uh, I promise it's kind of to to show you how to create a queue without salary with just, you know, Redis and 20 lines of code. But I, I'm afraid I don't have much time for that. I don't, I'm not gonna do that. Uh, what I wanted to ask in the fi uh, at the end is that first, that's it. Uh, and also is just to remind you uh, that we are always searching for speakers better than me, you can talk about whatever you want. It has to somehow be related to Python. It doesn't have to be like heavily related to Python. You can probably start your talk with some Python code and then switch to, the, to your favorite topic. Uh, yeah, that's also, <laughs> that also can be an option. And please go ahead and join our Facebook page. We do have also our group and we do our meetups on monthly basis, kind of. We're trying to do this on monthly basis. Sometimes we fail. Uh, sometimes we don't have speakers. Sometimes we're just lazy. But we're trying to do this as often as possible. OK, so now I guess it's question time. I have a question. So, um, I have multiple questions. Um, so, you said that uh, Redis is one of the brokers. Uh, what other brokers are available to integrate in Um I mean, there is, well, there is not that many brokers available <laughs> uh, on the market. Uh, no, sorry, RabbitMQ, uh, RabbitMQ is the lower level broker. So imagine RabbitMQ is MySQL, right, for database. Celery is, uh, for example, SQL Alchemy. So uh, yeah, yeah. Celery work, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know which, uh, what are the other brokers that are compatible with Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, sorry, yeah, yeah, now I get it, I get the question. So, only two of them are officially kind of supported, and that are RabbitMQ and Redis. Uh, but in, in principle, it can work with anything. I do remember that it works with MongoDB, it can work with Amazon SES, and uh, probably with relational databases too, I'm not that sure, but probably you can make it work. I'm not sure it's a good idea, but you can in principle do it. Which one do you use? Uh, to use? Well, at Duis we don't use Celery because there has to be an extension of the talk which, where I had to <laughs> explain how you can create a very simple replacement of the Celery with, with just JDS and 30 lines of code, and that's what we kind of use. But uh, I also, but I used Celery previously, and we use Celery uh, both with Redis and with RabbitMQ. And the choice is basically what do you have uh, on your system, what system administrators are familiar with. And also with Redis, you have to remember that Redis uh, works in memory. And if you have too much tasks put to the queue, it can blow up, and kind of that's it. So probably for more or less serious installations, uh, you have to use RabbitMQ. But do, just don't remember that it's written in Erlang and nobody can write Erlang. Have you done a benchmark using uh, what's called the official uh, library for RabbitMQ versus using Celery with RabbitMQ for kind of the same uh, purpose and see if there's a performance penalty? Or um, do you think that the abstraction is kind of uh, uh, the cost of the Celery abstraction are kind of uh, uh, no, the, uh, we didn't make any benchmarks, but the cost of the salary abstraction is not that high because, I mean, you can understand how it works, right? It's, it's basically what you would do yourself, right? It's like pickling the message, putting to the queue, getting the message executing, getting back the result. If you don't care about results, you can just turn it off. And this is the same which you would do yourself, right? I mean, there's no other way you could do this. Um, the problem with salary is there is like probably too much code to support those abstractions. And when the code is broken, it's very hard to debug. So I guess this is the main uh, drawback of using Celery against your own solution or something like that. It's not like the performance penalty. 
is the penalty of supporting this code base because you kind of have to own that code base. There's a lot of it. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with uh, Luigi, uh, framework for uh, building pipelines in Python. Uh, no, sorry, no. Oh, okay. I, was, I was curious uh, if you could make a comparison salary and Luigi. Um, maybe Luigi is not exactly the same, uh, solves the same problem, but um, it would be interesting to see. I, I think maybe salary is a bit more low, lower level than Luigi. Uh, but, uh, uh, so you're using for Luigi, right? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm considering salary and Luigi because uh, I'm, I'm considering some, some, some of these frameworks for, for building a, a social media monitoring uh, yeah. project. And uh, I'm considering some, some, some level of abstraction for uh, pipelines and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. cubes and, and stuff. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just considering it. I was just asking you to work on your Okay. Maybe if anyone does it's also I don't know. Maybe anyone? Okay. No? Okay. No. Nope. Okay, maybe it's a nice topic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or at least, I mean, if you're a l at least a little bit familiar with that, you can share this on the lightning talk. Okay. Uh, if not, well, <laughs> next time maybe we'll have a talk about Luigi. Okay, so that's it, right?